אנחנו מודים לה אבא בשביל הצלב, בשביל הדם של המשיח, כשהוא משיחנו, שנשפך בשבילנו. תודה אבא לרוח אחיך, לדבריך. תדריג אותנו בדרכך, ותן לנו אבא החוכמה והמרץ, לא רק לשמוע, אבל גם כן לעשות לפי מה שכתוב בדבריך, בשם ישוע המשיח, אדוננו, גוא עלינו וצדקתנו. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every good thing and every blessing. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood of your Son that was poured out to cleanse us from sin. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth and your word, which is eternal truth. We pray, Lord God, now you'll keep us in your way and you'll give us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. The subject I've been assigned is the death of reason. The death of reason, and I suppose... It is a good sequel to Dr. Oliver. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Ishayahu Hanavi, Perak Aleph, Psuk, Shmona Isre. Isaiah 1, 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they will be like wool. And the word there for reason, no nacha, no nacha. Nochacha, reason. The book of Isaiah opens and closes with God wanting to reason with man. There are several differences, fundamental differences, between biblical Christianity, that is the gospel of Jesus, and religion. There are several fundamental differences. One, religion is obviously man trying to reach God. Well, the gospel is God trying to reach man. The gospel is the diametric opposite of religion. Secondly, religion speaks of the brotherhood of man. Man is basically good and we can build a better world. The gospel says man was created to be basically good, but he's basically fallen. You'll never build a better world. The world is fallen, has to be redeemed. It cannot be redeemed by those who made it fall to begin with, specifically us. At least, not the unregenerate. Thirdly, or even the church, of course, Christ will return to do it. But thirdly, every religion in the world is based on a blind faith. You need something to explain the unknown. You need something to deal with your fear of death. Buy my product. Be a Catholic, be a Protestant, be a Hindu, be a Muslim, be a whatever. Religion is always a blind faith. Just believe. Our faith is not a blind faith. We have a conflict in a way of reasoning in the Bible. The Hellenistic or Greek way of thinking says, let me understand, then I'll believe. The Hebrew way of thinking says, believe, then you'll understand. God uses the Greek way of thinking to get people to put their faith in God. But once they put their faith in God, he expects them to trust him by faith, then they'll understand. But it's not a blind faith. Biblical Christianity is not an intellectual faith, but unlike other religions, it is intellectually defensible. It has a defensible apologetic for it. Other religions do not have empirical evidence to support their historicity. There's empirical evidence for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. One of the ways I got saved, I, tried to, I became a Christian by first trying to disprove the Bible, first with science, then with history and archaeology. And of course I wanted to know well, why the rabbis didn't believe it. The two biggest opponents of the gospel were the pagan Roman government and of course the Jewish rabbinic establishment. But pagan Roman historians like Tacitus, Suetonius, they admitted that it was common knowledge throughout the Roman Empire that there were Christians who knew other Christians, some of them themselves had been eyewitnesses to the claim that Jesus had rose from the dead after he was dead. Can you imagine people, many people, many thousands of people, some in North Africa, some in the Middle East, some in Europe, willing to die the cruelest of deaths, even see their families martyred, testifying with their dying breath they saw this man alive after he was dead. Uh, Buddha never rose from the dead, Muhammad never rose from the dead. But what got me was something called the Avodah Zerah, a rabbinic tractate written by rabbis that was designed to prevent Jews from believing in Jesus. Because by the second century, about 25% of the Jews in Jerusalem believed he was the Messiah. 
That's even according to the Jewish historians like Max Demont and so forth. They were trying to prevent Jews from believing in him. And this tractate, the Avodah Zerah said, Jesus, they call him Yeshu, derogatorily, may his name be blotted out. He did miracles as no other rabbi. His disciples, his Talmidav, did miracles in his name. They healed the sick. They even raised the dead. And that after Jesus was crucified by the Romans at Passover, at Pesach, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives, from Har Zayatim. That's not the New Testament. That was not written by Jews who believed in him. It was written by Jews who did not believe in him and who were trying to prevent other Jews from believing in him. It's one thing when your followers say things about you. It's another thing when your opponents admit it's true. <laughs> Quite a thing. No, our faith is not intellectual, but it is intellectually defensible. Other faiths are not reasonable, as I'll explain in a moment. But let's go back to where we left off yesterday and maybe even pick up on where Dr. Oliver was. Worldviews. The worldview that has predominated most of the 20th century is Hegelian. Hegelian. It began in the 19th century with the philosopher Hegel, 19th century German rationalism, but the worldview of the 20th century was Hegelian. And it emerged essentially from Darwinism. What Hegel basically said, and most of you know this if you went to university or anything like that, you've got the triangle. This is not very well focused. Better, worse. You got a thesis. You have an antithesis. And a synthesis. Darwinistic thought, man and ape have a common evolutionary ancestor. <laughs> Things evolve. There's a conflict between thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So lower primates, phylogenetically inferior primates, are in conflict with phylogenetically superior primates, and you wind up with the Homo sapien. Well, understand something about Darwinism. If you were to take it to its natural conclusions, it is a pseudo, I would say, pseudo-scientific basis for racism. Because it was people of white European descent who went to the moon, who get most Nobel Prizes in science. <laughs> Therefore, people who are non-white must be genetically inferior. That is what Darwinism, taken to its natural conclusions, would have to teach. Hitler did that. Stalin did that with the Ukrainians. Imperial Japan combined this with Shintoism, did the same thing. It is a pseudo-scientific basis of racism, but this has been the worldview of the 20th century. It's inherently racist. The problem is, it's never worked. Let's begin with something we all witnessed in our lifetime, the collapse of communism. Not socialism, but Marxist dialectics. Followed the same thing. Karl Marx said that is capitalism evolved out of feudalism, so Marxism would evolve out of capitalism. And following his Darwinistic way of thinking, what did he say? He said, well, because England was the first capitalist country and the first industrialized economy, a Marxist uprising of the lumpen proletariat would commence in Great Britain. It would never work in Russia. Russia was still feudal. But instead of communism beginning in England, the first capitalist country, it begins in Russia, the last feudal country. It was the dead opposite of what he said. It didn't work. But right up until the 1980s, the old men in the Kremlin had to keep pumping the party line. They would built their whole career on it. They would built the Soviet Empire on a false presupposition. Why didn't it work? Because the underlying scientific 
principles on which it was supposedly based were bogus. Darwinism is bogus. But the old men in the Kremlin had to follow a Darwinistic line of thinking applied to political economics. Even though it didn't work. Then there's theology. I left science as a kid and went into theology after I got saved, because that's what the Lord led me to do. I was supposed to be a neuroendocrinologist. I ended up a neurotic. Follows the same thing. Well, the texts of the Bible, they evolved over periods of centuries. We don't know what the original autographs look like. 19th century rationalism from Hegel comes to church. Rudolf Bultmann, higher criticism. These texts evolved. They changed. There's a big difference between the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history. Then comes the Dead Sea Scrolls. About one quarter of them now in the public domain. No, it has not changed or mutated. There is no significant theological difference and relatively little textual difference between what we have now and what they dug up at Qumran. More than that, Jewish scholars, Jewish rabbis, academic rabbis, with no pro-Christian prejudice, going back to the late 1970s, early 80s, began studying the New Testament from a Jewish perspective. A professor at Brown University, an Ivy League professor of Judaism, the foremost academic rabbi in the United States, Rabbi Jacob Neusner, Dr. Jacob Neusner, professor, orthodox rabbi at Brown University, said, the New Testament is the pivotal Second Temple period Jewish literature between the Apocrypha and the early Midrashim, and early rabbinic writing. He said, Jews had to write this. So the professor Pincus Lapid, Orthodox rabbi, professor at Hebrew University. So did Dr. David Lusser, uh, Flusser, Orthodox rabbi, also a professor of Jew Judaism at Hebrew University. These were rabbis. These, again, were not Christian scholars. These were people who didn't believe in Jesus. But every one of them said the New Testament had to be written by Jews. There was too much familiarity with the Sitzim Laban, with Jewish culture, Jewish religious thought in the first century, to be written at a later date by non-Jews. The liberals are in trouble. The only good thing about liberal churches is they self-destruct. Their membership goes down every year. They go into social gospels to try to stay relevant. And they still decline. The World Council of Churches. The World Council of Kooks. Yet, the same as we had the old men in the Kremlin, we have the old men in Yale Divinity School the old men in Union Theological Cemetery. They built their whole lives on higher critical presupposition. Barbara Thiering, the so-called Jesus Seminar, they have to keep pounding the drum of the same old line. Why? It all comes from Darwinistic thought. But now Darwinism is in trouble. They built their whole career on a false presupposition. Everything would have to get thrown out the window. Let's go back now to the post-enlightenment period. Or, I'm sorry, to the pre-enlightenment period. The old worldview was based on, essentially, Newtonian physics. Einstein and, and Niels Bohr, they threw that stuff out, most of, not all of it, but most of it. Not noticeably, not the first law of thermodynamics, not the law of conservation of matter, conservation of energy, and notably not entropy, not the second law. But much of the Newtonian worldview was thrown out by relativity. But the old worldview of astronomy, of the cosmos, old cosmology, was based on Ptolemaic astronomy, that the Earth was the center of the universe. Long comes Galileo, long comes Copernicus, long comes Kepler. This is what the evidence is saying. You can't say that, how dare you? So today the Darwinists are, for this time in history, what the opponents of Kepler, what the opponents of Copernicus, and the opponents of Galileo were for that time in history. Intellectual hypocrites. Academically bankrupt phonies who are motivated by a self-preserving interest for their own aggrandizement in absolute contravention of the irrefutable evidence. 
bonus are the old men of the Kremlin. They built their whole life and career, their whole power structure comes from the lie, so you've got to keep telling the lie. And you've got to keep telling it to yourself, even though you don't believe it. <laughs> and I'm sure some of them don't believe it. The death of reason. The death of reason. In my wayward youth, I went to a lecture on protein synthesis in university. I'll never forget it. There are 20 amino acids left and right-handed. Forgive me, most of the science I learned as a kid is either outdated or forgotten, but I'll do the best to recollect what I can. I'm half senile to begin with. We're supposed to get the right combination of amino acids together right down to the level of atomic covalency to eventually, eventually get something called a peptide. Then you need a whole chain, a whole chain of peptides to get a polypeptide. Then a whole chain of polypeptides to eventually synthesize one protein for which there must be an equally complex coenzyme. It's different now because of Cray computers and so forth, but even in the 1970s, if you were able to determine the structural formula of one protein, it didn't matter what it was, just because you could do it, you would have got the Nobel Prize because it's such a long molecule. <laughs> All controlled by information. Pick any world-class university with a science of faculty, uh, a faculty of science. Anyone, anywhere in the world. More than half of them are in the United States. Caltech, Sanford, MIT, obviously. Rice in Texas, any one of them. Go into the Faculty of Information Science. They will tell you, as in other words, Dr. Oliver did, there is no auto encryption. There are software programs that can write other programs, very complicated logarithms, but there are software programs that can write other software programs. But somebody still had to write the master program and write the logarithm. My wife teaches logarithms. She's amazing. She's the only math teacher in the world who can't balance a checkbook. But anyway. <laughs> Anybody who thinks Jews are smart has never met my wife. She married me. What does that tell you? There's no auto-encryption. It doesn't exist. Take the elevator downstairs, walk across the campus to any biomedical faculty. Biology, biochemistry, medical science, dental, it doesn't matter. And they will tell you there is. Just think. When Star Wars was proposed in the 1980s by Reagan, the argument was, we don't have computers that can simultaneously handle 100,000 lines of information. That was one of the big arguments against it. 100,000 lines of information. The human genome alone, minus the 10,000 or 11,000 that we left out, just the human genome alone, as it is, is 13 billion. <laughs> You can't come up with 100,000 lines, but now you've got nucleotide sequences, 13 billion nucleotide sequences. Information science says, this is impossible. That's what they'll teach you if you study information science, you study computer science. That's what they'll teach you at MIT or Caltech. You go to the same university across the field, walk down the campus, and go in to study biomedical science, they'll tell you there is. This is nonsense. But it's not the first time we've seen this nonsense. This nonsense existed in the days of Kepler, of Galileo, of Copernicus. But let's go further. No! There is absolutely no empirical evidence for the transmutation of recombinant nucleic acids across the genus barrier. 
Now, I didn't used to believe that. I always said there was absolutely no empirical evidence for the transmutation of recombinant nucleic acids across the genus barrier. I made a mistake. Now I know there must be evolution. As I told Dr. Oliver yesterday, there has to be Darwinism. Anybody who believes that stuff must be related to a baboon. <laughs> 13 billion just in the human genome. I'm not talking about the lobster genome or the zebra genome or the poinsettia genome or the biosphere genome. It's just not reasonable. They're asking us to defy reason. Let's continue. I was not a Christian yet. I was an agnostic. I knew there had to be a God. I didn't know who or what he was. Like many people of my generation, I tried to find God and truth and meaning in some strange ways. I began with chemistry, specifically lysergic dimethylide, better known to most people as LSD. <laughs> I actually began experimenting with psychedelic drugs to try to find meaning and truth. Went to the occult and hippies did all that kind of stuff. But just studying in university, biomedical science, nothing else, no pro-Christian prejudice. I'd been a Marxist in my youth. I was anti-religion. I didn't understand the difference between the real Jesus of the gospel and that plastic dude on the dashboard. I went to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. I was both sprinkled and clipped. I hated all organized religion. But it became obvious to me, abortus provocatus, they had no clinical distinction between infanticide and non-therapeutic abortion. There was a small percentile of cases Things like ectopic pregnancy, radio-induced uh, mutagenesis, vaginal cancer. There was a few rare cases. But essentially, more than 99% of the abortions being performed after Roe v. Wade were non-therapeutic. They were carried out for no clinical reason. So let's go to a major children's hospital. There's one in Pittsburgh. There's one in Philadelphia. Pediatric hospitals. We have a big one in England, in Liverpool, where I live. You can go to the neonatology ward. They'll be spending several thousand dollars a day sometimes to keep one premature baby alive, some of them down to 17 fetal weeks gestation. But you can abort a baby in most Western countries electively up to 24 weeks gestation. So you're fighting to save the life of one premature baby, spending thousands a day to do it, in the neonatology ward. Get on the elevator, go to the gynecology ward, they're aborting a fetus of the same age? No. Older. They can save one at 17 weeks, but you can abort one at 24? It's not logical. It has no scientific logic, embryologically or clinically. None! But there's a right to choose, we're told. What choice does the baby have? What I'd like to ask is, you're pro-abortion? Do you think your mother should have had one? It's just not reasonable to carry out any kind of an invasive procedure for no clinical warrant. The kind of tissue that lines intestines, you, you, in any mammal, but in, speaking human intestine, human intestinal tissue, is columbar epithelium. It's a single strata. Intestinal tissue is hyperabsorptive, meaning it's hyper-susceptible to communicable infection. It will tear and rip very easily. It is structurally designed to facilitate 
excretion, not penetration. Look at the statistics. Homosexuals have a reduced longevity of 25 to 30% less than heterosexuals. Things you wouldn't think of, four times more likely to cause a serious automobile accident, six times more likely to be a substance abuser, eight more times likely to have a cardiovascular disease, dozens and dozens of times more likely to communicate certain cancers like a sarcoma, and in the developed world, thousands of times more likely to become HIV positive. I'm supposed to believe it's gay! What is gay about reducing somebody's longevity by a third? The fact of the matter is, simple anatomy. What any first year medical student or dental student will tell you. This kind of tissue is not the same as the vaginal epithelium. It is not designed for sexual penetration. It's just not reasonable to call something abnormal, normal. But we're told it's normal. We're supposed to believe it in defiance of the scientific and medical evidence. I was born this way. They have no genetic evidence. But I'll tell you what there is evidence for. Unless it happened in a penal institution, find me a male homosexual that did not have, that did not have a weak or absent father figure. Find me a lesbian who did not have a weak or absent mother figure. How about single parent families? How about the divorce rates? Is there a correlation between that and homosexuality? Oh, statistically you can quantify that easily. But you're not allowed to say it even though it's a statistical fact. Throw reason out the window! It's not politically correct to be reasonable. It's politically correct to be a moron. This is not new. This is medieval Roman Catholicism. Believe what we tell you to believe. This is what we tell you to believe it. Let's continue. Reason. Where is the reason? It's just not reasonable. You know, we have some people here from Sudan. About 3.3, possibly 3.4 million Christians have been murdered by Muslim Arab militias in the last 14 years in Sudan. Iran has executed 80% of its evangelical pastors. Saudi Arabia, you'll be capitally sentenced if you become a Christian under Wahhabism. People who the Bush family said are our friends. President Bush, after September 11th, to honor Islam, put a Koran in the White House. To honor Islam, a book that says God has no son, because he's born again. Politicians in Texas are all born again at election time. I lived in the Middle East for years. There is one country in the Middle East that will protect the human rights of Christians and the religious freedom of Christians. There is one country in the Middle East that will protect the human rights of women that don't exist under Sharia. There is one country in the Middle East that will even protect the human rights of homosexuals and lesbians. That is Israel. Who does the left-wing media say we have to get? Who does everybody want to boycott? Saudi oil? God forbid. What are they going to do about these human rights abuses in the Middle East? I know! We'll find the one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights of Christians. We'll find the one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights of women. We'll find the one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights of homosexuals and we'll boycott them. That'll solve the problem. You're supposed to be a moron. Otherwise, you're not ethical. in their rather perverted view of the world. Nobody would ever say an Apache can occupy Arizona 
How can an indigenous people occupy a homeland? But although the archaeological record confirms that the Jews are the indigenous people, the only ones older than, are the Canaanites, and they don't exist anymore, somehow a Jew can occupy Bethlehem or Jericho or East Jerusalem. How can an indigenous people be called an occupying presence? It's not logical. Sioux Indians, uh, Lakota Indians, can't occupy the Great Plains of America. They were here first. Let's continue. Let's understand the world in which we live. It's crazy. I've seen Europe become more and more socialistic. East goes west, west goes east. Federalism failed in Eastern Europe. The federal states of Eastern Europe all broke up sometimes violently. The Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, it did not work in Eastern Europe. And being governed by an unelected socialist bureaucracy did not work in Eastern Europe. They rejected it. So now the European Union in Western Europe is embracing the same thing that failed in Eastern Europe. Just look at this country. It is true that our government left us with a mound of debt. As Carl pointed out, Ronald Reagan got this country addicted to debt. A lot of naive, silly Christians thought he was a conservative. What fiscal conservative would quadruple the national deficit? But I ask another question. He ran on a pro-life political platform. Who did he appoint to the Supreme Court? Sandra Day O'Connor, a pro-abortion judge. Who wrote the decision ordering the Ten Commandments out of the Judicial Building in Alabama? Sandra Day O'Connor, Ronald Reagan's pro-abortion Supreme Court judge. Who issued a Supreme Court decision outlawing Texas anti-sodomy laws that opened the door for same-sex marriage in the states? Sandra Day O'Connor, a Reagan Republican appointed by Reagan. He was, said he was a conservative. He lied to Christian America. But people still cherish him as some kind of a hero. A man who sold weapons to terrorist Iran. Now, Democrat, Republic, it doesn't matter. We want the God's judgment. That was the beginning of debt. Bush, another conservative, went further with it. And now Obama's digging us in deeper in order to get us out of it. What triggered this mess? Subprime lending. Where did subprime lending come from? Began with Jimmy Carter, expanded by Bill Clinton. This is not political, I'm only stating facts. It was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. In other words, socialism. Federally controlled and funded corporations. Remortgaging. It was socialism that got us into this. Now we're going into socialism to get us out. It's just not reasonable. But who cares about reason anymore? Reason is dead. But there's nothing less reasonable than false religion. We're the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. The Journal of Discourse is volume 17 of Brigham Young. There's Quakers living on the moon. They live to be a thousand years old. Joseph Smith said, that was Joseph Smith. Brigham Young said they're also on the sun. <laughs> Our ministry has an outreach to the Mormons every year in Utah, Nantai, Utah, led by David, back at our book table. And I went one year, and they were all wearing t-shirts. Brigham Young said it. I believe it. That settles it. I have the Journal of Discourses. So you believe there's Quakers living on the moon? I got a burning in my bosom and I testify to you the church of Latter-day Saints is true. Same as yesterday. And I got a burning in my bosom and I testify to you this Quakers are living on the moon. It's just not 
reasonable. You have to be nuts to think there's Quakers on the moon. You must be out of your mind to believe there's Quakers on the moon. Jehovah's Witnesses are even more absurd. The greatest woman who ever lived was a Jewish girl called Miriam. Not Mary, Miriam. The angel Gabriel appeared to her in the Magnificat and said, Blessed are you among women. You're the greatest woman who ever lived. You're going to be the mother of the Savior. He will save his people from their sins. First words out of her mouth. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Your baby's going to save his people from their sins. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. First words out of her mouth when Gabriel tells her, her baby's going to save the people. I need a Savior. But the Roman Catholic Church would later decide the Immaculate Conception. No, she doesn't. Who do I believe, Mary or the Pope? It's just not reasonable. If all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, I'm sorry for calling her Mary. I respect Miriam. I esteem Miriam. I think Miriam is fantastic. I think Miriam is terrific. I think Miriam is sensational. I greatly look forward to meeting Miriam. But I want nothing to do with that stupid, dumb, blonde, bimbo, shiksa, Mary. St. Paul tells us, forbidding marriage is a doctrine of demons. He made them male and female, said it was good. You outlaw what's natural, what do you have? Out of 179 Roman Catholic dioceses and archdioceses in America, once again, in 177 of them, every diocese, every Roman Catholic archdiocese, every bishop, archbishop, and cardinal has been found guilty of protecting pedophile nuns and priests at the expense of not protecting the children whose lives they destroy. How can you believe in something so evil? Every diocese in this country, similar in Canada, similar in Australia, similar in New Zealand, similar in England, and worse in Catholic countries like the Philippines, Brazil, and Ireland. How can you say, say this is right? The Bible says it's demonic. Look what they're doing. It's just not reasonable to believe this bastardization of Christianity they call the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm being gracious by using that description. Now Miriam, the mother of Jesus, lived in the first century. Another woman with the same name in Hebrew, Miriam, the sister of Moses, lived in about the 13th century. They lived 13 centuries apart. Greeks use letters for numbers. Romans, like Roman numerals, they use letters for numbers. Hebrews use letters for numbers, but the Arabs invented digits, numerals. Given the fact that they invented numbers, you'd assume they know how to count. The Quran says that the sister of Moses and the mother of Jesus are the same Miriam. You gotta be stupid to believe this. They lived 1,300 years apart. The thing is a nonsense. Cults are getting so irrational. Scientology, absolute absurdity. I recall walking through the streets of Mumbai, India. And uh, I saw a little baby on a terrible mound of smelly garbage. The tribe was obviously tubercular, severely malnourished. And he's laying there in the garbage. One of God knows how many, I wouldn't say thousands, tens of thousands of children in the same state. But this is in a big city, Bombay, Mumbai. Thousands of people walking by him and ignoring him. Right up the road, in the middle of the city now, right up the road, they were feeding cows sacks of wheat. 
the life of a cow was worth more than the life of a baby. I saw it with my own eyes. That's their religion. That's his karma that he's starving. At least people knew that things like slavery and apartheid and whatever were unjust. In Hinduism, it's not unjust. Why are people in the Western world following gurus, practicing yoga, and going to ashrams? Look what that stuff did for India. It's not rational to drink water from the Ganges because you think it's sacred and die of cholera. It's not rational to drink cow urine. They actually sell a cow urine flavored drink in India. They think it's holy. How can people in the West be turning to something like that? The social injustice is much more ugly, much more devastating in those countries than it is in the Judeo-Christian West. I once saw the Dalai Lama on television in South Africa being interviewed. He speaks pretty good English. It's nature there somewhere, isn't it? I, I can never spell that word. The Dalai Lama was acknowledged by Pope John Paul II to be a great spiritual leader. In the interview, the Dalai Lama said, we're different than Christians and Jews because we don't believe there's a creator. But even though we don't think there's a creator, we can still be one with Christians and Jews by closing our eyes together and meditating with them about things like peace. He doesn't even believe in a creator. Yet the Pope calls him a great spiritual leader. And although he does not believe in a creator, he allows himself to be worshipped as a reincarnation of the Buddha. It's just not reasonable. not reasonable. These things are nuts. You pick up a copy of the Old Testament, the Torah, the Tanakh, and read it. You won't find any such thing as a rabbi in the Torah, yet the rabbi is called Moses Moshe Rabbeinu. You won't even find a synagogue in the Torah. After the temple was destroyed, as predicted by Daniel, the Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Daniel chapter 9, 26 and 27. Jesus echoed Daniel's prophecies. They no longer had a Levitical priest who no longer had blood sacrifices, no longer had a temple. So they invented another religion. You've got to be out of your mind to read the Old Testament and think that the rabbis are practicing what Moses believed. As Jesus, my favorite rabbi, is Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef, I mean it said it, better known as Jesus of Nazareth. If you believe Moses, you believe me also. If they really believed Torah, if they really believed Moses and the prophets, they'd know he's the Messiah. It's just not reasonable to believe in these things. But people do. And to see people in the West turning towards Hinduism or to something completely stupid like Jehovah's Witness. But let's go further. That's the world. That's unsaved people. Those people are not regenerate. They profess no saving faith in Christ. Turn with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is within you yet with gentleness and reverence, etc. That word defense is apologia, an apology. Not as in apologetic regret, but as in an intellectually plausible defense. 
there is empirical evidence for the claims, the historicity of Jesus and his resurrection. It is not a blind faith like Mormonism or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. It's not a blind faith. Now, it's not an intellectual faith, but it is intellectually defensible. Our faith is reasonable. The suspension of critical faculties is not God's idea. He says, don't do it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We're told not to abandon critical faculties. The Greek word is kritikos. You have a critical spirit. I certainly hope so. The word of God says I'm supposed to. Look with me, please, to the epistle of James. Chapter 3. Verse 17, but the wisdom, that is the Sophia in Greek, from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and reasonable. You're a theist. It's reasonable. The gospel is reasonable. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Our faith is reasonable, therefore our conduct as believers should be reasonable. So the New Testament teaches. Instead, what do we see happening? How much of what's happening in the church today is reasonable? Is it reasonable to be ecumenical? Is it reasonable to say people atone for their own sins in purgatory when the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin? Is it reasonable to bow down before a graven image when the word of God calls it idolatry? Is it reasonable to pray to the dead when the word of God calls it the sin of necromancy? When the apostles condemn the consumption of blood, is it reasonable to pr practice vampire religion, transubstantiation? Acts 15, they condemn the consumption of blood. Is it reasonable? No, it's not. But you see, not only has the world gone mad, not only has reason died in the world, reason is dying in the body of Christ. There is no way you can reasonably justify ecumenism. The reformers made a lot of mistakes. They got a lot of things wrong. I don't consider myself to be a Protestant. I'm just a Christian by the grace of God. Nonetheless, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Cranmer, every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest. Not only were the reformers Roman Catholic priests, they were humanist scholars. They were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy. I'm writing on the back of humanist scholarship in the 16th century, following people like Erasmus and John Collett they, and Le Fevure, they went back and read the Greek scriptures. They found out that the Greek word metanoia means to repent, not to have a sacrament of penance. They realized the whole thing was a lie. That the sale of indulgences was a con job to build the Vatican and to build cathedrals and basilicas in the Renaissance. And they above all realized the lie of transubstantiation. They arrived at the conclusions of sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, and were willing to put their lives on the line to proclaim it. And countless, thousands and thousands, gave up their lives confessing it. It's not reasonable to try to make Roman Catholicism or liberal Protestantism compatible with biblical Christianity. But let's stop throwing rocks at Rome. The Church of Rome is not an apostate church. Apostasy means apostasia in Greek, to depart from the truth. Roman Catholicism has never departed from the truth. It never had the truth to begin with. The apostate church is mainstream Protestantism. Although there's much sexual perversion in the Roman Catholic clergy, and always has been, you won't find same-sex marriage or homosexual and lesbian ordination in the Catholic Church. Liberal Protestants do that. Churches in the World Council of Churches do that. 
Not even Rome would go that low. Not overtly. Anything published by the Roman Catholic Church that has the seal of approval of the Vatican is imprimatur and has an island obstat. You will not find a single Roman Catholic theologian, not a Dominican, not a Jesuit, none of them, will ever publish anything denying the historicity of the virgin birth or the resurrection of Jesus. But you'll find no shortage of Protestant theologians writing that stuff. Protestantism has become more heretical than the Church of Rome, more morally reprobate than the Church of Rome. Reform what? Roman Catholicism is not apostate. They never departed from the truth. They never believed it. But so the gratia, so the fide, so the scriptura, it's mainstream Protestantism that is backslidden, that has departed from the truth it once had, that has become theologically, spiritually, and morally reprobate. That was supposed to align with each other and then get in bed with these other religions. Just like Rick Warren. Reasonable. No, it's not reasonable. A criminally convicted pedophile sent to prison for molesting a seven-year-old boy from Canada comes to the United States claiming to be born again. Gets himself covered head to toe with tattoos. He's on YouTube kicking old ladies in the face and in the stomach. He's debunked on Nightline, ABC News. He cannot medically document his claimed healings. They're debunked by the Palmer Hospital in Lakeland, Florida. He claims to get visits by a personal angel called Emma. Who must have been one of the broads he took off with to Hawaii last February. He also claims personal house calls from Jesus Christ. Now Jesus said he will come back the way he left, the angels told us at the ascension. Jesus warned us if anybody says he's come back physically, get away from them. He'll come back via Mount Sair in southern Jordan and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. There will be a parousia, a return of Christ for sure. But Jesus himself warned us repeatedly in the Olivet Discourse, if anyone says I've come back physically, get away. Every time there's a Roman Catholic Mass, they say Jesus returned physically. They bow down to it, they worship it, they pray to it, they call it the Blessed Sacrament. They say it is a physical appearance of Christ. It is idolatry, it is cannibalism. But then Bentley claims Jesus gives him personal visits. It's not reasonable to believe somebody who contradicts what Jesus said without any mitigation. Then he goes on from there. He says he was taken up to heaven and he saw St. Paul, and St. Paul gave him this teaching. And then some of the main Christian leaders in this country, C. Peter Wagner from Fuller Theological Cemetery, <coughs> Jack Deere, formerly of Dallas Theological Seminary, which is turning into a seminary under its present leadership, Che Ann from Los Angeles is a real winner, and the proven false prophet Rick Joyner and so-called Bill Johnson, I'm only stating facts, it was on television, it's in YouTube. Prophesy over this guy that he's going to be God's agent to bring revival while he's kicking grannies in the face. A few days later, he leaves his wife and three children and takes off with a babe. Is this reasonable? Is this reasonable? Is it reasonable to give any credibility whatsoever to a Rick Joyner, a proven false prophet, or to a Peter Wagner? No, it's not reasonable. How can we expect reason in the world, in society, in the government, if there's no reason in the church? If the church has lost its mind, what do we expect from unsaved people? It's just not reasonable. The New Testament teaches the love of money is the root of all manner of evil. You chase money, you'll lose your faith. Now notice the issue is not money, but the love of money. 
You chase money, you will lose your faith. The word faith preaches, going back all the way to Hagen, Copeland, and these people, if you're not chasing money, you don't have any faith. Who do you believe? Copeland or Jesus? Do you know what these people actually believe? It goes back to somebody influenced by the Christian science cult, which is neither Christian nor scientific. Mary Baker Eddy. Her ideas were transferred into hyper-Pentecostalism. Now, I'm a moderate Pentecostal myself. I'm not speaking against gifts of the Spirit. The people like William Branham and E.W. Kenyon. They cooked up this doctrine called Jesus died spiritually. On the cross, Jesus said, It is finished. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. They began teaching. No, no, Satan got the victory on the cross. Jesus became of one nature with Satan in hell and was tortured three days and three nights and he was born again in hell. Then he rose from the dead. That is the basis of the beliefs of Joyce Meyer, first edition of her first book, Kenneth Copeland, all of them. No, Jesus said, it is finished. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. Satan did not get the victory. Jesus did in his death and in his resurrection. So because the cross of Jesus is not their view of the gospel, neither is the cross of Jesus their view of the Christian life. Instead of pick up your cross and follow me, it's, you're a king's kid. Grab it and grab it. Name it and claim it. They don't teach faith in Jesus. They teach faith in faith. These are the very false prophets and false teachers Jesus warned would come in the last days, and they're all over the idiot box. They've made born again a household joke, coast to coast and beyond. It's just not reasonable to believe these money preachers. They're liars, they're heretics, and they're con artists. But who cares about reason anymore? In the last days, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate teachers in accordance with their own desires. In other words, Benny, Kenny, and Joyce. It's just not reasonable. Oh, but people are saved through that stuff. People get healed. Isn't Matthew 7, 22 in your Bible? Many will come to me saying, Lord, did we not do this and this? Yeah, you did. Now get lost. Jesus never taught you'll know them by their gifts. He taught you'll know them by their fruits. But let's go on. This is the church, you understand. This is the church. It's not reasonable to believe the purpose-driven lie. It is fundamentally contrary to biblical Christianity. He omits repentance from the gospel. On his website, he does a hatchet job on scriptures that a Jehovah's Witness would not have the audacity to pull. Translocation of verses. Rick Joyner literally, literally, highlight and delete Acts 1, 6. Highlight uh, Matthew 24, verse 3, and do a cut and paste. So it becomes, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming? Don't worry about that. You're going to be my witnesses. When they ask Jesus in Matthew 24, what will the sign of your coming be? He gives a long litany of caveats to look out for. Satan's deceiver, Rick Joyner. No, keep away from that stuff. It's a diversion. Don't be ready for the return of Christ. Forget about what Jesus said. Don't look out for this. Listen to me. Who cares what Jesus said? Who needs Jesus Christ if you have Rick Warren? Who needs a New Testament if you have a purpose-driven lie? Who cares what the Bible teaches if you can read the shack? It's just not reasonable to believe these things are in any biblical sense Christian. You know why they're reading those things? Because they're not reading this thing. The first and foremost defense against error is always a knowledge of the truth. And so we have the purpose driven lie. Sheep are led, not driven.
But because the New Testament doesn't teach what Rick Warren teaches, he has to do something else. He has to get something that, if it was a paraphrase, it would be a big improvement. What is his Bible of choice? Eugene Peterson, the message from hell. John chapter 1, verse 1. M-R-K, Kaihologov. In the beginning was the word. Get to verse 14. And the logos became sarks. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word for dwelt is kataskeno in Greek. Essentially a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew shekinah. You know shekinah glory? He shekinah among us. Kataskeno shekinah. What it's saying is the same God who dwelt in the Holy Ark in the Old Testament would now become incarnate. The Word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. That's what it says in Greek, in every manuscript. What does Eugene Peterson say? The Word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. Nobody who can read Greek would consider that to be the Bible. It's not even the Bible. It's not even scripture. Yet you've got thousands and thousands of pastors subscribing to this garbage. They've lost their mind. And it's getting worse. Instead of going back to the first century church, Rick Warren and his friend Brian McLaren appointed people to the emergent church. They forwarded Dan Kimball's book. You know what the emergent church sees as the ideal? The Dark Ages. The 8th century, the Catholic mystics. They want to go back to the Dark Ages. That's what Christianity should be like. Postmodernism comes to church. Yeah, the emergent church, all right. It emerged from the pit of hell. It's just not reasonable. Now, there's a whole other dimension of things like discernment. But even unsaved people should be able to reason to some degree. But Peter says, the heretics that get in the church will behave like unreasoning animals. Peter actually says that. There will be people in the church in the last days who behave like unreasoning animals. People who go to Toronto or Pensacola are behaving like unreasoning animals. And I say that with shame as a Pentecostal. That stuff's not Pentecost, it is sick. Come, let us reason together. Our faith is reasonable. Reason? No wonder the world has lost its mind. No wonder society has lost its mind. Jesus never called secular academics to be salt and light. Jesus never called secular politicians to be salt and light. Jesus never even called scientists to be salt and light. He called his church to be salt and light. If we've lost our mind, what do we expect from the world? They've lost their mind. Oh, they have. But so have we. You've got to be crazy to believe this stuff. But they're believing it. What's God's response? God's response has always been the same. Our faith is reasonable. Prove me wrong. Prove the scripture wrong. You won't be arguing with me. I'll only argue from scripture. Our faith is reasonable. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube, 
deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Parpezzo, Parpezzo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.